Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Bartlett. I'm the faculty director for the Institute of Regional and International Studies, and I'm a professor in educational policy studies at University of Wisconsin Madison. Thank you so much for making time to be here with us this afternoon for Dr. Manisha Bajaj's talk about transformative human rights education. I'm going to turn it over now to Kathy Villalon, who's going to introduce Dr. Bajaj. Uh, hello, everyone. Dr. Monisha Bajaj is Professor of International and Multicultural Education at the University of San Francisco. She is the editor and author of six books and numerous articles on issues of peace, human rights, migration, and education. Dr. Bajaj has developed curriculum and teacher training materials, particularly related to human rights, racial justice, ethnic studies, racism and xenophobia, and sustainability for nonprofit and national advocacy organizations, as well as intergovernmental organizations such as UNICEF and UNESCO. In 2015, she received the Ella Baker Septima Clark Human Rights Award from Division B of the American Educational Research Association. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Bajaj. Thanks so much for having me. Should I get started or um, Professor Bartlett, did you want to share a little bit about IRIS? Um, I can. So IRIS is uh, in the international division on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And there are eight affiliated centers that do area studies work across the globe. Uh, for example, African studies or Middle East studies or Southeast Asian. Um, and there is one center that's devoted to international studies that's also called IRIS, it's called the IRIS NRC. So um, IRIS has been funding this series on human rights and education. And uh, this is our, our third talk in the series. You're welcome to join us for the others. And we're delighted that Dr. Bajaj could be here with us today to talk about her work in, in multiple locations. Today, she's gonna emphasize uh, India and the United States. Um, but she's a veteran in uh, human rights education, and I know we have a lot to learn from her. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Bajaj. Great, thank you so much um, for having me. I'm excited to be here virtually in this space. Um, and I wanted to start with a couple stories first and then share a little bit more about human rights education, what it is and what it looks like in different places. Because I know of our participants, there may be different um, different levels of knowledge about what this field is and, and how it what it looks like in different places. So I'm gonna start first with a story about a young woman named Swati, who I interviewed in a rural village in the Eastern Indian state of Orissa. Um, and this was a few years ago. The year prior to when I interviewed her, she was 12 and in the sixth grade. Her parents had told her that they were going to pull her out of school and get her married. Their economic circumstances were such that they couldn't afford another mouth to feed, and they had found a family willing to marry her that wasn't demanding too much dowry, which seemed to them like a great opportunity. Swathi was studying human rights through a program run at her school by a non-governmental organization, and she didn't want to leave school to get married at such a young age. She took a friend with her and went to the police to report what was going to happen to her marriage under the age of 18 without consent, dowry, and being pulled out of school before age 14 are all illegal actions in India. The police, however, told Swathi that she should just listen to her parents and not to make trouble. But she had her human rights textbook from this non-governmental organization program that had been running in her school for several years. And in that textbook was a phone number. And that phone, a list of phone numbers, in fact, and those phone numbers were not just to the local police, but to non-governmental organizations, watchdog agencies that were run by the state government. And she had those numbers available to her and she showed them to the police saying that, I'm gonna call these organizations if you don't enforce my rights. She demanded that the police take action. They got scared that maybe this young 12 year old girl might actually report them to her teacher or to the non governmental organization that had contacts in the state capital and that they might face some sanction. And so the police decided to intervene and they convinced her parents to delay her marriage and let her stay in school. Since that action and intervention, Swathi became a, a leader at her human rights club at school. She attended statewide trainings and summer camps for human rights defenders and really took on an identity of wanting to study law and become a human rights activist in years to come. The next story I wanna tell you about is about a young woman named Sang. These are pseudonyms, of course. Sang was 10 when her family decided to leave Burma. The military was confiscating land and depriving families of their only livelihoods. 
her family decided to escape to Malaysia aided by a human smuggler. At one point, her and her sister, who was just a couple years older than her, were separated from their mother and were almost kidnapped by traffickers who would have sold them into human slavery. Once they did get to Malaysia as an unauthorized migrant there, Sang worked in a restaurant, she cooked for her family, and once in a while went to a school run by the United Nations for Burmese migrants who had come to Malaysia. They were able through the United Nations and other resettlement agencies to get asylum in the United States. And she came to the US at age 16, not speaking a word of English and working after school in the back of a restaurant. In her human rights club at her school, she came to understand her family's migration story better and to grapple with the unequal conditions in Burma, in Malaysia, and now in a high poverty neighborhood in California. Sang said, I had got all my rights destroyed by others, but now is the time for me to fight to get my rights back. So I wanted to start with this story just to talk a little bit about who are individuals who are involved in human rights education whether it's the participants or the educators, and just to give you a little glimpse of who we're talking about before we get into some of what this field is, what it looks like, where it came from, um, and some of those issues. So I want to talk about how human rights education came about and how it traveled to places like rural Orissa, to refugee communities in California and across the globe. So let's first talk a little bit about human rights and a document that was signed 72 years ago in December of 1948 to place human rights education a bit in its historical context. So to start with, um, I want to get a sense from this audience and I know on Zoom it's a little tricky but I'm gonna invite people uh, to chime in and, and share, brainstorm a few answers about what you think was happening in the 1940s in the US and across the globe. So what are some things that set the stage for this foundational document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was adopted by the UN in 1948, where we draw a lot of our kind of modern human rights movement from? What was going on in the years prior to 1948? And you can unmute and just, uh, it's hard for me to see everyone, but if you wanna just chime in with some things that you know that were happening either here in the US or elsewhere. So in the chat, there are several World War II answers. Great, okay, so World War II for sure. What else? Y'all free, feel free to unmute yourselves to answer. Everyone's being polite. Let's see. There's um, one person said, uh, Lauren Lauder said, a deeper understanding of the horror of genocide of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, labor movements, Kate said, uh, end of the Holocaust. What else does anyone want to contribute? Charbonne asked, what's the question again? And Natalie what said, the UN. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What was happening in the 1940s globally? Any more responses in the chat or I can move on. We can uh, get to some more conversation after too. Lauren says India's independence. Yep. Natalie said UN founded. Great, okay, well. Um, some of these I have, so World War II, which lasted formally from 1939 to 1945, with 80 million deaths cataloged between the genocide of the Holocaust, as well as military action, civilian deaths, widespread um, famine caused by a lot of the actions of nation states during this time. Um, genocide, Holocaust, 6 million Jewish people killed, Roma, LGBTQ, and others. Nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 200,000 deaths, many lifelong disabilities, illnesses coming about from that that lasted generations onwards. Um, in the US, we had widespread Jim Crow segregation. Um, there was lynchings, apartheid in South Africa, colonialism in much of Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Europe and Asia were in ruins from the war. Uh, we see the beginning of the Cold War emerging. And as was mentioned, the partition of India and Pakistan that led to the forced migration of 12 million people through that partition and 2 million estimated deaths from that. So we think when we look at politics in the US that things are really bad right now, but sometimes when we put it in historical perspective, we realize that there, there have been moments where, where things have been quite bad. And the 1940s certainly was a time globally where people were really suffering. And the world had this moment of many, you know, there were many precedents of the League of Nations, the, the Nobel Peace Prize that were created in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, but there was this tremendous momentum to create some type of global governance that would allow for nations of the world to come together and create sort of a supranational, above the nation state, um, moral authority uh, with some type of um, ways of, of interacting and relationships that would lead the world towards greater peace and human rights at that time. So that was the moment in which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was considered. Um, the former president of Panama came to San Francisco at the signing of the UN Charter in 1945 with a draft bill of rights that he wanted everyone to sign on to. And people were like, wait a minute, we need some time to think about that. So a committee was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, she didn't actually draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, though she often gets the credit for it. There were philosophers and leaders and thinkers from various countries, some of these that I listed here. There were some prominent women involved in that from the Dominican Republic, um, from India, um, I think there was some other women from, from Europe as well who were involved in the drafting of this. So they took three years from 1945 when the UN Charter was signed till 1948. And every comma, every word, every clause was hotly debated. Um, I'm definitely happy to recommend sources on that if that's of interest to you. There's several books on um, those debates that led to, you know, some people wanted this word and some people wanted that word. And it was a very rich and productive generation of this document that then was brought to the UN General Assembly in 1948 and adopted by them as a cornerstone document of the, the new United Nations system. So what are some little known kind of facts about this process? Well, one is that there were all these individuals from different countries who drafted this document. The other is that um, Latin America was actually the main champion of social and economic rights in the document. A lot of people think it was the Soviet Union, but they actually ended up abstaining in the final vote because of has, you know, um, resistance to some of the language in there. But Latin America has a very strong social welfare, social democratic tradition. And a lot of the, the rights, like the right to education, the right to housing that are listed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came from the Latin American delegates to this committee. Egypt is responsible for the strong universality language. So a lot of times um, when we think about human rights, we think about this debate between universalism, kind of the one size fits all and cultural relativism. And in today's kind of landscape, a lot of people often think that it's the West or you know, the, the global North that's calling for universality. But if we take ourselves back 70 years plus to the moment in which these debates were happening, it was actually former colonial nations that were saying, we want universal language. Because if you think about it, there were barely um, 45, I think, nations that were part of the United Nations when it was created. A lot of the globe was still under colonial rule. And it was the colonial powers that didn't want universal language because they didn't want colonial subjects to say, we have the same rights as our colonial masters. So Egypt was very strong in saying that it has to say that all rights apply to nations and people living in territories under their jurisdiction. And this was a response to the debates about whether colonies had the same rights as their colonial powers. So it's a very different moment that we need to think about where this document actually was very radical for its time. Women in 1948, so India, the Dominican Republic and Denmark pushed for gender neutral language. Um, obviously, it's binary language. It doesn't have the benefit of what we know now, 70 odd years later, but the fact that it didn't say men only, it was extremely radical for that time as well. Um, and if we think about the historical context in Australia, Aboriginal men and women could only vote in 1962, 14 years after this document said that all men and women have the right to politically participate and vote. In Switzerland, women could only vote in federal elections in 1971. 
And in, we look at certain places like Saudi Arabia that women are, are just being enfranchised for the first time in recent years. So it really was a document that was ahead of its time. And these are some pictures of the delegates from India, the Dominican Republic, um, and different places that we have this historical record from the from the United Nations of these of these debates um, and discussions among the group. So human rights education really anchors itself in this document because part one of Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about everyone's right to an education. But part two really recognizes this fact that it can't just be an education that is about indoctrination. It has to be an education that has to be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. So part two of this article guarantees not just a right to education, but a right to human rights education in 1948. And this language, some of the debates that led to this getting enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was coming immediately out of the experience of the Holocaust and genocide. In Germany, you had universal, fairly universal access to education. Um, but what a lot of members who were party to the development of this document said is that didn't stop people from experimenting on humans, from carrying out a genocide, from you know the Nazi party having widespread indoctrination through schools that led to some of the horrors that people saw. So people said, well, it can't just be a right to education. It has to be a right to an education that really does further the cause of peace and human rights. So that's where part two of Article 26 comes about. So since the 1940s, we see education and human rights really united by three different sort of prepositions. We see education as a human right, especially as widespread decolonization of former um, colonies happened across the globe. I think the UN is now at 195 nations. So from 45 to 195 in um, 70 years is a lot of, of you know, newly independent nations where people had been denied um, access to education. I think I recently saw a statistic that at the time India gained its independence in 1947, 6% of the population could read and write. So obviously educational access, getting people into schools, providing basic literacy is a huge part of fulfilling that human right to an education that had so long been denied in so many places. The other part that I think in the last 30 or 40 years has been coming into more um, view is education with human rights. So if you bring people into schools and try to offer basic literacy numeracy but you reinforce social forms of discrimination. The girls are in the back, the boys are in the front, um, or certain castes or ethnic groups are allowed education while others are not. Um, does anything really happen that is of an empowering or, or you know, liberating form of education? Or does it just reinforce the way that social inequalities exist? So education with human rights is really talking about a lot, you know, fulfilling this promise of quality education, dignity, no discrimination in education. And then we have in Article 26, as mentioned, education for human rights. But it, you know, for a long time, obviously the first two here were of greater priority when you have so many historical forms of marginalization in the education process. So I would say education for human rights really took off um, after the end of the Cold War, the coming, um, the dismantling of the Soviet Union um, at the end of the 1980s, early 90s. In 1993, there was a world conference in, on human rights in Vienna where the action plan from that stated that human rights literacy at all levels was a huge priority for the globe in terms of human rights. And from that came a UN decade on human rights education, um, UN agencies focused on this, uh, a huge boost to non-governmental organizations that were already working on this. We see curriculum, teacher education, pedagogy, a focus on active citizenship and learner-centered pedagogy coming out of this push for education for human rights. So obviously all three are extremely important, but they kind of have different moments when they've come into the, into the global discourse. So some milestones as mentioned, the 1995 to 2004, immediately after this Vienna conference was named the United Nations Decade for Human Rights Education. And this is where all UN agencies kind of come together around a certain theme. Um, during that time, over hundred countries put forth national initiatives on human rights education. A lot of countries also looked at their curriculum to identify human rights 
um, content and figure out how to teach it in a way, um, remove things that were not human rights friendly. And coming out of that decade, there was a decision made to continue this work and a unit was housed in Geneva um, with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights called the World Program for Human Rights Education. And it is ongoing and it's a unit that coordinates plans and um, global action on human rights education. And in 2011, there was a UN declaration that was adopted by the General Assembly on human rights education and training, which is a huge milestone for the field of human rights education as well, because it's more sort of global law and um, you know language and moral kind of frameworks that talk about the importance of human rights education and training at all levels. So it's human rights education in schools, in communities, in um, the training of police, judges, social workers, et cetera, that's called for. And those of you who are familiar with the UN know that a declaration doesn't have binding force. It's kind of a moral document that provides direction and a set of priorities by the United Nations, but it doesn't have legal kind of standing as something that can be enforced through, through law. But it is certainly a step forward for the field. So this graph, um, you can kind of see the, the mentions of human rights education and publications in um, global documents. And you know it ends at 2001, but I would say if you go forward, you would see many, many more in terms of the global field of human rights education growing in mentions and popularity and organizations and funding um, in programs. I direct at the University of San Francisco the first program in the world, which is a, um, a master, first master's program on human rights education um, that exists anywhere in the world. So all of these things are happening as this global field grows in prominence and um, importance. So what are the types of human rights education? This is a graph that kind of talks about the different ways that this can happen. So one way is a formal explicitly called human rights class. And this could be a weekly class, it could be units in a textbook, explicit instruction that names it as human rights and teaches it to learners at any level. Or you know, it could be in a community-based non-formal setting as well. So the non-formal sector would be it could be run by organizations, it could be action oriented, it could be popular education that's using, um, you know, uh, taking into account lower literacy, using images, generative themes, if we think about Paulo Freire's ideas um, of how to, you know, think about education that's accessible to people and get them thinking about um, social realities. It could be through the co-curricular, um, after school clubs, school projects, assemblies, performances, um, theater, etc. These are ways that human rights education has come into the formal curriculum, as well as some of the, uh, you know, the co-curricular parts of schooling, as well as in community-based settings through non-formal and popular education. So obviously you have this kind of and I think this is unique to the field of human rights education. I also do a lot of work in the field of peace education. And people often ask, you know, what's kind of, what's different and what's unique about each? And, you know, this is something that I've been working on a lot with a collaborator, uh, Maria Hansopoulos on too. We have a book coming out next year where we talk about the differences in the fields of peace education and human rights education and then where they really unite. But I think what's unique about human rights education is that you have this international level, you have these UN documents, you have these decades, these um, discourses, these conventions, these declarations that really see human rights education as a way to um, enact and deepen a form of global citizenship. And so that's happening at this kind of global discursive level. While at the same time, you have at the grassroots level, human rights education being tailored for communities and social movements for resistance and social change. So you have different actors taking up human rights education, often with different um, ideologies, different motivations, different populations, and different goals of the project. But you have people using the same discursive frame to do very different things. And that's why I think that human rights education is really interesting. And research in it allows you to delve deeper into what, it, what does this person mean by human rights education? And why are they using this term as opposed to social justice education or democratic education or peace education? Um, it's a, to me, a field that's ripe for further investigation because of this global discursive prevalence and then the reasons why people opt into using it. So scholars have talked about some different human rights education outcomes. 
One is obviously knowledge about human rights, the history of human rights as a field, certain violations, certain conventions, certain movements. But in addition to that, just that alone is sort of seen as a super, superficial form of human rights education. Scholars have argued that it has to have this affective and attitude change kind of component that if you go through human rights education and learn about the history of the United Nations and the human rights framework, but you don't do anything when someone is um, being bullied at your school, are you really doing anything with that human rights education? So obviously this affective attitude shift as well as an action oriented component that really makes human rights education be transformative and have this liberatory potential um, as a process. So I like this definition. I like the UN definition. It's very much about global citizenship and international friendship across borders, but I like this Amnesty International definition a little bit more because it talks about actually doing something with the knowledge that one would get from human rights education. So Amnesty International says, human rights education is a deliberate participatory practice aimed at empowering individuals, groups, and communities through fostering knowledge, skills, and attitudes consistent with internationally recognized human rights principles. Its goal is to build a culture of respect for an action in the defense and promotion of human rights for all. So what's missing in the UN definition is the action piece. It talks a bit more, and I should have put that up on the slide, I'm sorry. Um, they talk a little bit more about friendship among nations, tolerance, respect for others, but doesn't put an onus on the learner to take action. Whereas this definition really sees kind of the building of defense and action for human rights from the human rights education process. So I wanna talk a little bit about what human rights education actually looks like in practice and give you some examples for two, from two research projects that I carried out, one in India from 2008 to 2012. This is a cover of the book that came out of that research. And then another project in the United States with immigrant and refugee students from 2014 and 2017. And I give you some glimpses of that in the opening vignette. Swati was a student in the research in India and Sang was a student in the, in the project in the United States. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about India first. So in India, there are a lot of human rights problems in, in society and in schools. So one is that while it's outlawed legally, just like dowry and early marriage and pulling girls out of school is also outlawed, corporal punishment is outlawed, but I saw evidence of it pretty much in every school that I visited. So it's one of those things that's often looked the other way. Um, a lot of Teachers and students and parents said that I don't understand how my student will learn if they're not afraid of being beaten. So it's just something that is very ingrained, even though it's technically illegal. Um, something else that I saw and read reports on and have still see evidence of is a lot of caste discrimination in schools. So some students would be made to clean while others were learning. Um, the Indian government has provision for every kid to receive um, meal, a midday meal at school in government schools. And oftentimes their beliefs around caste about pollution and purity. So kids who were from um, groups that are known as Dalit or formerly untouchable groups would not be allowed to sit or touch the food um, because they were believed to be polluting it. Um, kids would be separated in seating and similarly with touching water sources, a lot of discrimination in those regards. Often there would be insufficient or non-existent latrines in schools. Um, that continues till this day. And UNICEF has a study that 50% of girls end up dropping out by the time they hit puberty because there's no facility in school for them to use a clean, open and available bathroom. And there's a huge problem of teacher absenteeism. In different states, there are different statistics, but in India overall, it's been noted that on any given day, 25% of teachers are not at work and that you know there could be people writing in that they're there or you know different ways of getting around it. And that obviously has a huge impact on quality. So in this research project, which was designed using um, Professor Leslie Bartlett, who is your IRIS director at the University of Wisconsin and her collaborator, Fran Vavris's vertical case study, comparative case study design. So I did um, review of documents, policy documents. I interviewed policymakers and non-governmental organization staff, over 80 of them. I did participate observation at key events, focus groups and interviews with more than 600 students in these programs. 
I interviewed 118 teachers and headmasters, and I visited 60 schools and nine NGOs to really understand who was using this framework of human rights education at different levels, what did they mean by it, and what was happening on the ground. So I wanna to present to you a little bit about this one organization that I focused on, which was called the, International, the Institute for Human Rights Education, IHRE. Um, it's part of a larger legal advocacy organization called People's Watch that's active in 22 of India's 29 states. And this organization had developed textbooks on human rights education in 14 regional languages and was operating in 5,000 schools. This is an English translation cover of one of the textbooks there that you're seeing on the slide. The organization had trained over 6,000 teachers to give a three-year course in human rights education where teachers would offer an explicit human rights course two periods a week, so two hours a week, over three years to students in sixth, seventh, and eighth um, grade. And they've been operating since 1997, primarily in government schools that serve Adivasi or indigenous and Dalit formerly called untouchable students. So some of the most marginalized children in India were receiving um, this training in human rights education. And what they did is that in sixth, as students were younger, they would do kind of a general introduction to human rights. Seventh would be a real focus on children's rights. And then eighth, they'd get into more issues of discrimination, equality, um, issues of gender, caste, um, communalism, poverty, um, social issues um, that required probably a little bit more maturity of the students to really delve deeper and understand. So one of the things that came out from the data through the interviews, the focus groups, these observations, was really seeing students as current, not future human rights actors. So I'm going to um, read this quote for you. This is uh, from some of the students. Um, sorry, I have to move my view of all of you so I can read this. So these are students talking about um, talking about intervening in a human rights issue that they saw in their community after learning about human rights. After reading human rights education in sixth grade, I overheard in my area that a neighbor was planning to kill their newborn baby girl. And those of you who may not be familiar with India, this issue of infanticide and feticide of girls is very common across India and different states have different levels. Um, but there's a huge skewing of the ratio in girl children to boy children because of this practice of infanticide and feticide. It is actually illegal to find out the sex of your child in India, but doctors will often do it anyway, um, especially if there's a financial bribe involved. And what would happen in poorer communities where they may not have access to that was that a child would be born and then they themselves would, would, um, would figure out a way to, um, to eliminate that child. Child. So this person was, you know, people in communities are living very close to each other. So this, this student heard about it and heard what was happening with this newborn girl baby. They were saying that they would kill her. I formed a group of classmates and we went to their home. We explained to the lady that this is wrong, but the father didn't accept. He scolded us and he slapped us. We told him that the child also has a right to life. You should not kill the child. We said, if you're going to kill the child, we will complain to the police. We won't move from this area. We will stand here and watch what you are doing with this child. Often we used to go to that home and watch that child, but now that child is older and even studying in school. So there's several things happening here. Obviously the human rights education that took place in these children's school inspired in them a desire to take action. Their action got them physically you know, hurt in terms of getting scolded and slapped by this neighbor who was not very happy with this intervention, but whether it was real sort of, um, you know, the neighbor really being like, wow, you've changed my mind. I doubt that was happening. They were able to invoke this, this threat of reporting it. And obviously um, killing a child is illegal. And so this neighbor not wanting necessarily to have these pesky kids from the neighborhood reporting them and then having them getting involved with the police and maybe having to bribe the police and getting involved, they decided not to kill the baby. And what for these students, what that was, was a huge victory for them. They saw that they read something in school, they took action on it, and the situation um, came out for what they were advocating for, whether or not the reasons why it happened that way were exactly, you know, some human rights transformation on the part of the neighbor. But these children really talked about feeling empowered through this process of becoming actors in human rights at a young age, taking action in their community, becoming community um, sort of like 
you know, advocates through the process of learning about human rights education. I also wanted to talk about what it was like for, for students who learned human rights education who knew that their human rights had been violated. So this was another theme that came out through the research of victims of abuses finding support and sort of language to talk about what had happened to them. So this was a 16 year old girl in the state of Karnataka where her, in her school they had been learning about human rights education through this program as well. So she says, before I used to think I was the only person undergoing these problems of sexual abuse at home. Her stepfather was abusing her. But after reading this book, I learned that, about my rights and that there are so many boys and girls around the world whose rights are also being violated. I realized we should not keep quiet. I used to think that nobody was out there to help me and whatever torture I was facing in my family, I thought that it was my fate and I deserved it. But once I started reading the human rights education books, I knew I had to stand up and fight for my rights. So one day I told my stepfather to stop abusing me and I showed him the books saying that I would report him to the authorities listed in there. And just to say again, I think this was really brilliant by the folks who designed these books is that they had a page with phone numbers of who you call and they were specific to that state where the program was running. So it really gave folks like I'm learning about this, I'm seeing abuse and I have phone numbers that I can call um, in their hands. He got scared and my teacher helped find a residential home for abused girls for me to go live in. When I got there, I started teaching all the other girls about human rights with my HRE textbooks. In the future, I wanna be a social worker so I can tell everyone about human rights. So for this young woman, there was another point in the interview where she also said, I thought it was my fate, that this is just what I had to be resigned to, that you know, she was from a Hindu background and said that, you know, I thought that in this life, that I was born in this life and this is what I had to tolerate. But then when she read the human rights education textbook, and found examples both of violation where she was like, that's also happened to me and movements of people standing up for their rights and finding a resolution to um, speaking out against abuse. She really became inspired to, to speak up and take action and enlist her teacher as an ally in the process. So now I wanna talk a little bit about this project from the United States for a few minutes that um, we have left in this presentation before we open up to questions. Um, and this is a project that was from 2014 to 2017, and there's some ongoing partnerships still happening. But what um, myself and a team of doctoral students did here at the University of San Francisco is we led, um, and this was on the request of the school, that we did ethnographic kind of qualitative research in the school, but we also did what we call, an, I mean, others have called, and we go along with that of an action ethnography where we ran a human rights and global film club at the school every week um, in the afternoon in an after school program. And as part of that, we did interviews, we did observations at the school of different events. Um, we did classroom observations, we did interviews, we did focus groups, we used visual methodologies where students would um, create collages and images and then talk about them and bring in artifacts like photos and um, use those to drive interviews and then ongoing engagement with the lab school that Oakland International High School has developed. Um, and we've co-authored with um, the former principal of the school, with an alum of the school um, on different issues related to human rights and human rights education at this, um, in this school. So the background of a lot of the students, so this is a school that is a public non-charter high school that was created by the district to serve newcomer immigrant and refugee students. So a criteria for being accepted to the school is that you have to have arrived to the US in the past three years before ninth grade where most students get come in at ninth grade. You can come in later, but most of them do. So at the time we did this research about 51% of them were from Latin America, probably almost all of those were unaccompanied minors from Central America who had come to the US. Um, South, Southeast and East Asia made up about 32% of the students. The Middle East, primarily Yemen. 10% um, and then 7% um, of students from uh, Africa and the Caribbean. 95% of the students receive free or reduced priced lunch. 20 to 5 to 30% of our students are refugees with asylum and 61% of the students were male. 
So in the Human Rights Club, you'll see here, this was a collage that um, we would have different prompts and everything was very sort of participatory. The students that, the doctoral students and I, who were the team who did this, we all have kind of a pedagogical background. So we would create this um, kind of a curriculum of interactive activities. And then the students would talk about different things, bring in their life experiences. So in this activity, they were, they were choosing a particular human right that spoke to them and then creating a collage and then talking about that. So the club would do activities like that weekly, an hour and a half club. We would have participatory activities and discussions, field trips, films. Um, at some point, I think this was in the second year, the students really wanted to watch a lot of films. So then we kind of shifted to be a, a global film club that had a human rights theme, but we started as a human rights club that was much more sort of film sometimes, but activities other times. But the second year, the group that came in really wanted to watch a lot of movies. Um, and have discussions about them. And then the students would also keep um, journals where they would reflect. And those who opted into the research, then we used that as part of our data. Um, so some of the themes that came out of this research was this, this framework that we developed around the different ways that students were seeing human rights as they learned about them. The first was students seeing it as a mirror to their realities. So I'm gonna read you a quote from Zhao, who was a young, a young man from Burma. He says, prior to migrating to the US, um, my family had been undocumented migrants in Malaysia. He said, my goal for the future is to go back to my country to teach my people to make them equal. He was from the region of the Chin region of Burma um, that is uh, facing a lot of repression from the Burmese military. Um, he said, he, in one discussion, he pulled out a photo on his phone of his home in Burma that had been razed to the ground by the military and his, the, the family's land confiscated that led them to have to flee. Zhao talked about how different school was in the US from his prior experiences. At one club meeting, the topic of child soldiers came up while referencing a photograph of a young boy with a gun in Uganda that we had seen at a human rights exhibit that we took a field trip to. Zhao was often quiet, but in discussing the issue of child soldiers, he spoke at length. He said, it's good to see that it's not just us, not just our country, our families facing human rights problems. He said that what he saw in the photo was like my story. I had to go find gold in the mines when I was 11 years old. We had to dig holes 20 feet down and then go inside to see if there was gold. The Burmese military would force kids to do it because we were small and could go inside there into the mines. Because the government had taken over our farms and built things on our land, we had to leave and go look for work. The mine owners would hire children because we have more energy and we're so small that we can go inside the holes and go way down. Plus, if something falls as we dig, we can move quickly to escape. It was really scary, but I didn't have a choice but to do it. So this story really resonated for Zhao of what came up when we saw this exhibit and him connecting his own experience to it. So that was sort of this theme of the human rights education, providing a mirror where um, he could see himself through what we were learning about. But also when you look in a mirror, sometimes you can see what's around you, the context for what's going on. So he could see it was happening to kids in Uganda. He could see some more of what we were talking about in terms of the context for why he um, was in this, in this position. Um, and have some more understanding about this. So the second area that came out of this research, sorry, I'm having trouble advancing this. Oh, there were a couple other areas um, in that research. That was one of human rights education as a mirror. I'll just mention the other two and then I'll move into some discussion and then Q and A with you all, was human rights education being um, sort of a window into other realities. And this is a, um, a metaphor that's come up a lot in multicultural children's literature, especially how literature can be a window and a mirror. So a window into other realities and then a mirror of your own realities. And what we did through this project, through the data, is we also developed a third um, area, which was human rights education as a prism. So you can see the light refracted, you can see your experiences refracted in new ways and have new understandings about it. And so students like Sang, students like Zhao and other students in the club who were from Guatemala, from Burma, from Nepal, um, from the Philippines, from Yemen, they would talk about learning about human rights and understanding more about, you know, when they were young, their parents might not have um, told them about 
why they were fleeing or why they were going through things, but through the process of learning about human rights education, they could get new context and new understandings. And they could also put their experiences in the US in context because so much of the resettlement discourse is about the US as this kind of savior and now you're fine. And they were living often in highly violent communities where things would happen or there were inequalities, the resettlement agencies would help them for six months and then move on to newly arrived folks and trying to figure out their own positionality, especially the kids from places like Yemen where the US actions and war were part of the reason that drove them um, you know, folks from Syria, from Yemen, to be in the US, it was very helpful for them to understand human rights education as this prism. So I want to zoom out now and look at both the India project and the US project and um, tell you a little bit about some themes about that come out at this intersection of transformative human rights education for youth at the margins. So some of the larger themes from all of this work over the last more than a decade one was human rights education as a place to connect students' stories to a larger framework. That was a place of recognition, empowerment, collective understanding that we're not the only ones, whereas Zhao said, that's like my family. The second is learning about a larger imagined moral community where human rights offers a shared language. So seeing your own experiences, maybe not the exact experiences reflected back to you, it allows for critical thinking, critical understanding, and belonging to this larger imagined moral community where human rights is the shared framework. The third area is a chance to collectively question a social or cultural practice that doesn't fit with that framework that can lead to speaking up, solidarity, collective action, whether it's speaking up for your own rights or the example of the kids who intervened for the little for the baby that whose life was being threatened, that collective action on behalf of someone else or speaking up and demanding your own rights. And the fourth area was identifying allies, co-conspirators, whether those are teachers, peers, community activists, non-governmental organizations, to amplify one's voice in seeking change. And this was a process of strategic coalition building. Obviously, if one is a victim of a human rights abuse, it's hard to speak up without facing significant backlash. But that process of figuring out, okay, who can I enlist in my on my side to help amplify my voice in speaking out for change. So those were all different things that came out from these two projects um, when we look at them together. So um, I was part of a report um, that went um, as part of this Global Citizenship Commission to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Three of us authored this report. And I wanted to share this graphic that we had really talking about what transformative human rights education does. And this is a uh, an addition, kind of building on Fer Paulo Freire's ideas about the cycle of praxis, where you learn, you take action, you reflect on that action, and then you take, you go back to new learnings and take new action. So this, I'll, um, in the interest of time, I'll probably um, skip ahead, but just to say human rights knowledge leading to awakening of critical consciousness, motivation to act, agency, identification of individual and strategic collective action, implementation, and then going back to that cycle of learning again and thinking about new action. And then lastly, I wanna leave you with this quote from Paulo Freire, Brazilian scholar and thinker and philosopher, education does not transform the world. Education changes people. And here I would add human rights education changes people and then people change the world. Thank you. So let's go to some q and I'm gonna figure out how to open the chat now because I haven't been able to see your chat, but maybe Kathy or Leslie can help me too with reading some questions or- Yeah, we can get you first. started. And then folks, um, Essie's gonna fix it so you can unmute yourself and, and uh, pose your own questions. But there are some in the chat already, a couple that are, that are methodological, uh, Dr. Bajaj. So one was about uh, your most recent project. Are you planning to follow students in a longitudinal study? Yeah. So. I mean, informally, we're definitely in touch with a lot of students in that study and kind of tracking where they're going. We recently did some alumni focus groups to, to see where they are and how it's going. And one of them um, from the, the, the club, he, he actually became the president of our human rights club because he really wanted that experience. And um, he went on to college, a four-year college, and is now like one of the senators of his college, like the student government, and is going to graduate next year. And so we're definitely in touch with a lot of the students. We haven't been doing as much sort of longitudinal for the purpose of 
of writing it up, but kind of just tracking folks because we're deeply connected to them. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now with one of the alums of the school is to write up some of the lessons from this research and other schools as well that serve newcomer immigrant and refugee students, not solely focused on human rights per se, but to, to write up some of these lessons for educators to think about how, how best to work with these students, not from a deficit based perspective, but in ways that really empower students and honor their, their lived experiences. One other methodological question is about the organizations you collaborated, collaborated with and the policymakers you interviewed in India. Talk with us a bit about that. Yeah, so the research in India was from 2008 to about 2010. I did some follow up after that. Um, and I interviewed anyone who um, I could find that had been involved with curriculum, teacher education, um, human rights commissions, really who had anything to do at the policy level with using the term human rights education. So in India's national policy framework at that time for teacher education, there had been talk of human rights education. So I talked to the folks involved with that. The National Council for Educational Research and Training had been putting human rights into their model textbooks that are used in some schools, but kind of set the frame um, nationally that states can adopt or modify. So I talked to folks involved with that. Um, but for me, what was more interesting was the groups on the ground. So when I wrote up the research and in the book, there's definitely a, a privileging of the local experiences of the students, the teachers, um, the folks on the ground. Because I think with policymakers, oftentimes it's written on a piece of paper, but policymakers are also very careful to, to tell you kind of the party line. And so I, I definitely wanted to tease out further what that meant for folks on the ground as that's my personal interest on the transformative power of human rights education. I think policies are important and often it can set the framework for local actors to give meaning to those policies. But I personally don't see policy transformations without the corresponding local action as meaningful in the lives of people. So I can't name the individuals that I interviewed, obviously, for confidentiality. And I would suggest you look at the book. You can see their pseudonyms and what organizations they're with. If you know the Indian context, you can probably figure out who they are if you go back 10 years or so to who those folks were. A, a question uh, related to that, it comes from Lauren. She wants to know um, who was teaching human rights education and how were they prepared? Were these government teachers and geo workers? Yeah, so what would happen is that teachers would be selected from the schools that opted into this program. So oftentimes the organization, this NGO, and how they had gotten access to so many states and so many schools is that they wouldn't go to the school directly. They would go to a local official who oversees the schools, like a district official, and they would get their permission to run this program. So then all the schools in that district or that state, in some cases they were working statewide, would then all those schools would, would have to select a teacher to go to a training. And the first trainings were about three days and the teacher would be either volunteered because no one else wanted to do it or if it was a teacher who really wanted to do it, they would be the one who would be sent. And then that three-day training included issues of what human rights are, children's rights, and they used a lot more participatory approaches that one would usually see in the Indian context of very rote learning and exam focused um, instruction. So they had a three-day training and then every year there would be refresher trainings. Um, and so in some schools they would rotate who went so there became like a little core of human rights education teachers but it was always a teacher from the school. The NGO was never teaching the classes. What they would do is kind of check in with the teachers. There were zonal coordinators so a staff from the organization would be overseeing a certain number of schools and be in touch with them and let them know about regional trainings or refresher trainings um, or events. They would put on a, an event for human rights day or um, different celebrations like that, that people would participate in. Great. I'm going to pose Haley's question. And then after Dr. Bajaj answers, uh, Charbonne has a question. So Haley asks, how do you see human rights education changing with the COVID pandemic as students mm -hmm. uh, may not be able to be at school physically? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that I've thought, you know, I think you definitely can get some of the content in distance education, but that sort of interactive discussion based participatory um, activity type work is harder to to do in the distance learning format. I do think that one sort of silver lining of the COVID pandemic is the way that, you know, and obviously this has differential impacts based on socioeconomic status and and privilege and marginalization is the way that families are um, privileging their own community-based knowledge in um, having kids at home and, you know, kids learning how to cook traditional foods and learning 
about you know stories or history or the, their parents you know interpreting the curriculum for them in ways that bring up family histories or you know forms of resistance and I think that can have a human rights bent it doesn't necessarily have it but I think in COVID what we are seeing overall globally is just a huge exacerbation of inequalities that already existed so those with more resources and access are hiring tutors and forming pods those without access are, you know, I was interviewing a principal at another um, uh, newcomer high school here in California um, on Friday. And um, she was saying that, you know, some of the kids are barely getting a hotspot right, uh, right now, eight months into the pandemic. And, you know, they're just seeing huge dropout rates and kids having to work and, and do other things. Or, you know, maybe three kids are, there's one device and three kids are trying to to all log into their school and just huge um, gaps in knowledge that are happening. So I think COVID is a huge challenge to education in general and definitely to human rights education as a subset of education. Great, Charbonne. Hi, um, so firstly, with respect to the language difference, um, like human, is it is it because there uh, we need to make a difference between, say, adult education versus uh, education in schools? So, is human rights with res more with respect to uh, the schooling sector and uh, social justice and other kinds uh, for the adult education sector? Is there and because there seems to be some kind of a relationship there, and um, so, and the other two questions quickly is that um, the many of the things like uh, the first case of Swati in Orissa and then later on, um, there is a lot of things fell into place uh, together and therefore there were success stories. However, I'm just wondering that if like, uh, because this requires some kind of a resistant attitude to social norms and to various other things, right? So the fear of retribution uh, might be a deterrent and the actual punishment at home and outside um, might deter children to kind of come out and, uh, you know, like speak out. So my question then is that uh, would the children need some kind of uh, collective uh, action or is it an individual thing? And just pragmatically, this is one more subject that the teachers have to teach when the schools are already kind of overburdened. Um, is it possible to kind of integrate human rights uh, education within a part of uh, as a part of uh, professional development of teachers and teacher training? Or does it have to be a separate uh, subject? But I can understand uh, the efficacy of it. Um, it's just that we anyway struggle with these, you know, overburdened schools. Uh, so I don't know how, uh, how, so to speak, how, how do we scale up, you know, um, across the board for this? Thank you. Yeah, those are great questions. So the first one I'll say is when I was introducing the field of human rights education, I definitely wanted to mention that it's not just K-12 school based. There is these kind of community settings, popular education, non-formal, but for my research, I've always have I ever focused on a community based? I did some interviews with the organization BRAC in Bangladesh that, that has a huge non-formal um, human rights education program for rural women. So that's the only time I've really collected data from um, a non-formal based program. Most of my research has been school-based with schools, educators, students, um, but definitely to your question, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but I'll, I'll mention it as a response to it. Obviously, this was focused on children. So in the case of the project in India, they were focused on sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. Um, in the US, we focused for our club on ninth to twelfth grade. Um, but there were rifts that happened as students learned about um, human rights education and would go home and talk to their families. There were ways that families, especially those from marginalized communities, had you know, accommodated an unjust and unequal system for generations, right? And now all of a sudden the students were saying, you know, we shouldn't do this. Why are we not being allowed to go pray at this temple just because of the caste background that we're in? Some of the kids did a protest outside the temple and their parents who were laborers on the land that was owned by higher caste landlords threatened to fire them all. And so it created some sort of family rifts at times when the students were being activated based on what they were learning and their parents and elders were used to accommodating these social inequalities in order to be able to eat. So there's lots in there. I'm happy to, um, to send you articles where I talk about that more, but I'll go to your second question, which is um, are, 
one more subject. Second, no, second one was collective. So I do have a lot in my in the book where I talk about this, where especially for girls in these human rights education programs and those from lower caste or socioeconomic backgrounds, collective action was much more effective than individual action. And in fact, there were examples of individual children trying to take action based on these human rights learnings and having severe backlash, a, a little um, a boy who was probably 11 showed me a gash that had healed on his head when he tried to intervene in a situation of child labor and he got hit by the person so severely um, that he still had a scar from it. So I think what some of the recommendations that came out of my research was to really have teachers and the NGO focus on helping kids strategically understand how to intervene so that they don't put themselves and their physical safety at risk by being so excited by something that they seek to engage and then end up getting hurt in the process. And so I do highlight quite a bit the collective actions that students were taking that seemed to be more effective, especially if they were able to enlist a teacher or you know other adult allies on their side um, so that they weren't putting themselves individually at a huge risk. Definitely collective action was much more efficacious than individual action, unless it was individual action where that individual had enough status in that setting to not have some of the backlash come, come at them. Like for example, I'm thinking of a young boy in a family that was slightly higher caste who spoke up about something and the family responded favorably because he was a boy in the family and um, you know, was speaking up on behalf of his sister and et cetera. The third one, um, yes, about one more subject. So the National Council on Educational Research and Training in India at that time, now we're in a different moment in India with a different party in power, a different curricular focus. But at the time that I did this research, had a lot on peace and human rights education incorporated into these kind of national model textbooks that are used in nationally run schools. But what I found when I would visit schools and do observations is that what teachers would do is that they would tell students to cross out those pages that were about human rights and clip them together because they wouldn't be on the exams. So the integration into kind of national textbooks and into the curriculum, you could argue is there. The problem is that teachers are, you know, very instrumental and we're like, don't even worry about that. It's not going to be on your test. Don't, um, you know, don't worry about it. And they would be with other subjects too, where these, they would say from this page to this page, just cross it out, we're not covering that. With this NGO program where, you know, teachers were sort of asked to teach this, schools opted into it through their district officials, um, they would have these textbooks, they would not be, there were not any exams on it. And what students would say is that they, it was their favorite subject precisely for that reason. Because they would say, this is about our lives. They would bring in a lot of local examples. And every year these textbooks would be revised to incorporate new local content. There was a arm of the NGO that was focused on updating and revising and bringing in local examples every year. Um, and so the kids really loved these textbooks. They would carry them around, they would talk about them. Um, and they would say, this is about our life. This is so much more interesting than the other subjects. So there was this kind of love for it. it what, they weren't being beaten if they didn't understand what was in these textbooks because they weren't being examined on it. And so they had a different relationship to the content because of the way it was introduced through the NGO. That said, obviously, if human rights was integrated throughout the system, it was seen as important. It was seen as something that would be valuable and you know, maybe had uh, questions about it at some point or, um, you know, some sort of relationship to this more transformative element, I think it could be a better way to get it out there. But in the absence of that sort of system wide approach, this organization had figured out a way to really um, influence what was happening in these schools, which is very unusual for an NGO to have that kind of influence in this many thousands of schools across states. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response. Shruti. Hi, so my question is building on Charbonne's question. So you mentioned working with the NCRD and um, including um, human rights into the curriculum and the textbooks that are printed for schools across India. So being a part of CBSE and having done those books, I won't lie and say that when our teachers told us to staple those pages because those chapters are not going to be in the exam, students are not relieved because 
of the amount of information we have to cram up for our board. So even if it's foregoing one human rights chapter, it's a big uh, stress buster for us. Um, I was wondering, um, maybe a more influential way um, of integrating human rights education into education in India across boards would probably be collaborating with boards like state boards or ICSC or CBSC. Is that something you ever considered um, while working in India for human rights education? Yeah, so I was definitely researching what was happening and I um, was interested in this national level and interviewed a lot of people there and then the local level through this NGO and other NGOs. The reason I chose this NGO is because they were they have such a broad reach across different states and you know thousands of schools and had trained so many people and had been active for a while, but there were definitely other NGOs doing smaller scale work. There were also state boards and sort of regional people working on curriculum transformation and you know incorporating more examples into textbooks i didn't focus that much on it because it didn't seem like it was having you know it was similar where the textbooks might be reformed and then the teachers were telling the students to staple those chapters so what i was really i you know there's only limited time one has when you're planning a research project and you have to make decisions about where to focus so i really wanted to focus on the students the teachers their experiences um, on the ground, but I definitely did talk with some folks and the NGO had a, a state advisory board in every state that they operated in. And oftentimes those individuals were folks involved in these state boards or, you know, pedagogical leaders and educational leaders from those states who were involved in other activities and also advising this NGO. But I, I think that would be a great area for further exploration is how at the state level and these different boards are trying to, to implement these things. I just had to, you know, have some boundaries at some point in terms of the research. So I didn't delve into it much further than as it pertained to the this particular organization. Thank you, that was really helpful. Are there other questions? I see a question in the chat. What do you look for when you speak with alumni about the impact HRE had on them? So I think I'm usually pretty open-ended and you know, you have Kathy and Leslie and I'm sure other professors on this call who have different ways of they approaching interviews and methodologically how they do that. I tend to have pretty open-ended questions and you know, I usually will ask students about, you know, what, what do you remember about um, your schooling? experience and how did it how did it impact you and I let them go from there you know like I don't lead them to kind of ask about it and I recently got together a few months I was it was right before COVID so it seems like just a couple months ago but now we're talking about eight months ago um, one of the students from this research project and she had just graduated from college and um, this was the one in the U.S. with the immigrant and refugee children um, and she was talking about how after she had thought she wanted to go study architecture in college, but after being in the human rights club, she decided to study sociology and just got super interested in social issues, um, really became a leader at her college around these issues um, and was now, you know, entering the workforce full time. She had been obviously working part time and in, in college, but really wanting to figure out what to do with that. And she said, you know, when we were talking, she was like, it was the club that made me think about these issues and realize that I'm really interested in them. So I try to just be really open and, you know, it's hard to maintain contact with everyone that, you know, obviously the research in India, um, you know, we talked to probably over, you know, a thousand people during the course of those two years, it's hard to keep in touch with everyone, but certainly social media or, you know, email. I um, went to India just before the pandemic and um, got to go back and visit the organization that um, I had spent time with. And um, the director of the organization was, was very sweet. I thought I was just having lunch with him and his family, but he invited everyone who is uh, mentioned in the acknowledgement section of my book to come and surprise me at lunch. So I got to check in with a lot of the folks and see where, where, where they were and, you know, talk about the students they were still in touch with. So I think just having deep personal relationships with the folks in your research is a way to have a sort of organic longitudinal, um, you know, development, even if I don't write up anything that, you know, or publish anything about a longitudinal study and what happened 10 years later, there are ways that I'm still tracking and, and in contact with the people who, um, you know, were part of this research and obviously influenced me hugely as being a qualitative researcher deeply invested in these issues and, and these communities. 
There was an earlier question from Daniel that I missed. I apologize, Daniel. He asked, um, have you seen any impact or general change in the political atmosphere due to these shifts in youth public opinion? Um, in the US or India? I don't know, Daniel, I think may have dropped Daniel, off. Yeah. Well, maybe like um, I think um, public opinion about immigrants or I guess I'm unsure what the question was. Well, let me um, turn it over then to Charbonne because Charbonne wanted to extend that question. We may get uh, more specificity there. Thank you, Professor Bartlett. Uh, it's so I think I, I, it's related to Daniel's question in terms of the changes, like the effect on the political uh, atmosphere. But my question was that uh, does the already existing political condition affect how uh, the success of human rights? Uh, I'm thinking in terms of, say, regional differences in not only the in the uptake, but also uh, how successful it would become. For, for instance, um, given a kind of north-south difference in India, um, perhaps uh, the, the same program might not um, achieve achieve the level of success in um, UP as it would in, say, Karnataka. So, um, but both these, I, I think Daniel's question is also important that how, how is it changing, at least in the, uh, within the local, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the local conditions, how are they affecting the political atmosphere and how the how political, already existing political atmosphere affect the success of the program? That's my point, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. And I would argue that human rights education has to be deeply contextual. So you can't have a one size curriculum that you download from the internet and translate and apply everywhere. That's not gonna work. And you know, I think the UN has done some of that and we can see that it's not really working. And I think what there's a chapter in the book about the India project that is completely focused on the strategy and how this organization deeply engaged in strategic thinking about what would work in different states. And that what they did was they created state advisory boards in every state that they were operating in who would decide what examples to use, what were the local issues, um, what local examples of success that they would also put in there, examples of collective action and success, um, and really tailor. So for example, I remember I sat in as part of my participant observation as they were tailoring the textbooks for the Northeast of India, which is very different than a lot of the other places that the textbooks had originally started in the South and then they had gone to other states. Um, but the Northeast has a completely different context for those of you who are familiar with India. And a lot of the discussions there um, really took the textbooks and, you know, I would say probably 50% of, you know, they took some of the same themes, but the examples, the gender issues are different there, caste issues are different there, um, issues of indigenous communities are different. And so it really was a process of tailoring deeply the textbooks to the, and obviously you can tailor it to a state level, but different regions and communities in that state might also have different realities. But I did think that that strategic thinking, even within one nation state of how you would locally adapt it, and there would be maybe 10 or 12 state advisory board members who would be part of this discussion, and then one staff member who'd be sitting in and making, you know, taking notes and, and doing that. And there were, you know, journalists, um, content experts, pedagogical experts, educational folks, political folks, human rights activists who would be on these advisory boards really guiding it. And I think that's what helped it um, have the kind of local, um, you know, examples and relevance to the students. They, you know, a lot of students in rural areas had never, you know, heard about the examples that were written in their formal textbooks because they were written with such an urban bias. But the human rights textbooks would have a lot of local examples that they could connect to. So the students would say over and over again, these textbooks are about our lives. This is, you know, everything else is my education for an exam. This is about my life. And they would carry those textbooks with them really a connection, a deep connection to them. And I'll say in the US, I think, um, you know, obviously the political climate affects all of this. And, you know, just speaking as a, as a professor and a program director of a master's in human rights education, what we saw four years ago, immediately after the election was, uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks feeling that human rights were being attacked of many people, you know, Muslim Americans, women, um, you know, Latinx communities. We saw a lot of folks coming to human rights because of a changing political climate. 
and a gravitation towards the frame of human rights as a way to collectively push back on some of that. So I definitely saw an uptick in our enrollments that year immediately following the election and the year after. So I think different moments, there's different things going on. And certainly, you know, I haven't been deep in the textbooks in India since the political change in 2014 to know, but I mean, I've been following some about the new policy, the national policy on education that just came out this past summer, some of the shifts there away from the human rights language that was coming out and some of the more global citizenship language from the previous national policy education framework um, from about 14 years ago. So I'm following it, but I think definitely being on the ground and the, the deep qualitative work for anyone who, you know, the students on this call, being deeply involved in the context is extremely important because human rights education, it, it springs up in context and it has to be tailored to the context to, to have any sort of efficacy. So I think we've we've run out of time. Uh, Dr. Bajaj, we wanna thank you for being with us today and for this inspirational and, and challenging talk that you've given us. Uh, I know uh, Kathy Villalon and her students are uh, doing a lot of exploration around human rights education and I'll be curious to hear how they're taking up and extending what you've shared with us today. Thank you all for being here today and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. I just put in the link in the chat for the uh, fourth and last event in the series in case anyone's curious, you can see it there. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>